We're on Fisher's road to Reykjavik and the candidates' final match between Fisher and Petrosian in 1971. So we've got up to game seven and Fisher had won the last two games, so he's two points clear. So it's a 12 game match. So this was really, you could say, Petrosian's last chance in game eight to try and hit back. He had the white pieces. If he didn't win this one, then things, well, time was running out. And here, I think Fischer made a very canny choice. He played e6. Previously, well, in this match, we'd seen the Grunfeld, for example. Um, Grunfeld, a, a favourite of Fischer's, but also the King's Indian as well. But Petrosian would have been armed and ready for those openings. But instead, Fischer played a Tarash here with c5. And you could say the standard move here is to play pawn takes pawn. Now, pawn takes pawn is riskier here for black. That leads to uh, a, a straight Tarash after g3. But knight takes d5 was actually well, played later on in, in the fischer spassky match in Reykjavik. And this can lead to more exchanges after here and uh, later on. Well, here, I, Bishop B4 check. Fischer actually played Knight C6 here in, against Spassky. But yeah, it leads to exchanges. Petrosian, you know, he wanted to keep more tension. Wanted to have an open fight. So he played e3, and, and that's not a bad stra strategy given the game, the match situation. And now a3. This little pawn move at the side of the board looks a little bit strange. Actually, it's a very normal move. White waits to develop this bishop so that if black exchanges here, then the bishop can recapture in one go. But also, white may exchange on c5 and play b4 and then bishop b2. Knight e4 from Fischer. Again, that's kind of a normal move. Wanting to, to exchange some pieces. And now Petrosian played queen c2 and Korchnoi annotating the game in the Soviet news, chess newspaper 64 said, in my opinion, Bishop d3 here gives greater chances of gaining an advantage. The white queen is poorly placed on the c-file. A tempo soon has to be spent on improving its position. Yeah, the problem is that after lots of exchanges take place, very often a rook will come to the c-file to attack the queen. Well, we're going to see that in a second, actually. Knight takes. By the way, Korchnoi ought to know what he's talking about because he had exactly this position against Petrosian in their candidates match. And then Petrosian had played queen takes c3, which is very tame indeed. And there was a mass exchange of pawns and pieces in the middle of the board and so on. Well, that game ended in the draw fairly quickly. Of course, if white wants to play for a win, then you recapture with the pawn and strengthen the center. So bishop e7, both sides develop. Bishop doesn't have to come to b2, but anyway, he's waiting for black to castle so that he can gain a tempo with bishop d3 on this diagonal. And castles. And here, good move from Fisher. Uh, and this forces white into quite a big decision already. And here, I think Petrosian was maybe caught in two minds as to how he wanted to approach this game. You know, he didn't play it in the sharpest way. Um, Korsnoy says here that, well, you know, normally with the queen at d1, you'd exchange here and maybe play knight d2 or knight e5. The problem is if white does this now, let's just see this. If pawn takes pawn and let's say knight e5, then black can push the bishop 
either off this diagonal, that's not great to have to go back with the bishop, or the bishop will perhaps after a check come here. But then again, if the bishops are exchanged, then that certainly is of benefit to black and any initiative on the king's side for white just isn't going to be that dangerous. So you can see again another problem with that queen on c2. But of course, Noy, I mean, he's, he's a very optimistic player in his annotations. He said, well, you know, white could at least try queen e2 uh, to give the bishop room on this diagonal. And after this, then, you know, white has reasonable attacking chances. I suspect such um, a blunt way of attacking just wouldn't really appeal to, to Petrosian, actually. And I think black is, probably is okay there. But yes, I think Petrosian was kind of caught in two minds here as to how he wanted to press for the win. And, you know, when it came to a crunch moment, he didn't really commit himself, himself but instead put the knight back on d2 to cover this pawn. But then again, after these exchanges, then it is difficult for white to really go for it on the king side. I think you need a knight to develop a really strong initiative here, a knight landing on e5 or something like that. But with just bishops on the board, yeah, I think black should be all right here. And again, Korchnoi is, is very optimistic in, in his annotations. He said, I think that with a different match situation, Petrosian would have limited himself to rook d1 in this position. And then, like this, sorry, after rook d1, here, queen e2, and a4. You can see how the queen really does need to move because the rook is coming to the c file. And basically, it's about equal. I mean, neither side is in huge danger here. This bishop doesn't look great on b2, uh, but white, you know, could perhaps weaken a pawn here. But I think it's about equal. But after b6, Petrosian pushed forward with e4. Bishop b7, and because the rook is coming to the c file, then the rook shifts across. Rook c8 anyway. Now, here is where, um, again, Korchnoi's optimism comes in. He thought that white should press on with bishop d3. But I'm sure this wasn't Petrosian's liking, because you can see that there is now a lot of pressure on d4. Basically, to relieve that pressure, white is going to have to play e5, which gives away the d5 square, opens up this diagonal. But Korchnoi thinks, yep, let's just keep pushing pawns. This is very much Korchnoi's style. He loved space. He loved advancing his pawns, even if it meant some kind of structural weakness. And he finished up his variation by saying that you know, white retains attacking possibilities. But actually, black should be able to defend this without too much difficulty. You know, there's there's actually no threat here. And if necessary, rook here. And, and the king can even hide around here. Look at that bishop on b2. It basically can't get into the game because of these pawns. And black can take control of this diagonal. It looks really nice for black to me, but as I said, Korchnoi is kind of a very optimistic player. So Petrosian just ducked back with bishop b3, and now Fischer even started to take the initiative with b5. This is an excellent move. So apart from mobilizing the, the queen side pawn majority, it also gives the queen a beautiful square on b6, looking at d4 and supporting the queenside pawns as well. If queen takes pawn, then bishop takes pawn, so it's an equal exchange. But actually, well, you can see 
white pieces lined up on the B file. That looks really unpleasant. So after B5 from black, Petrosian pushed forward with F4. So only now he starts to really get going on the king side. Basically, once he sees that black is taking initiative on the other side of the board. But F4 looks like, well, too little too late. It's not, it's not, it's not even that. It creates serious weaknesses against white's king. Uh, as I said, I think Petrosian really was caught in two minds in this game uh, as to how he should play it. But this doesn't look right because it weakens these diagonals. Now, if white presses on with f5, let's see what would happen. So c4, the bishop has to go back. And then e5, another benefit of playing the queen to b6 is that it defends laterally along the sixth rank. So actually white's pawn pushes don't go very far. And now there's pressure on d4 and obviously on the diagonal too. And this pawn majority, well, probably a5 and b4, is also rather potent. Um, Korchnoi thought that after this, that white could get this in and yeah, you know, there's time to, time to rectify the situation, but actually there isn't time for that. After black plays a5, threatening to undermine the pawn on d4. This is just way too slow. You can see that white is in massive trouble here. If bishop b3, we can take. Now, pawn takes will allow black to pass pawn stomping down the board. And if bishop takes, well, just take it. Simple uh, sacrifice of the exchange. Well, you could hard, it's hardly a sacrifice. You know, these, these pawns are just rolling through. So queen b6 just played by black and white responded with king h1, stepping away from the, the queen on the diagonal. Now looking at this position, I think I'd have played a5 here without too much thought. It just seems so natural to mobilize the, the queen side majority. And you have options to either to exchange here and keep pushing or to play c4 and keep pushing. But, you know, it's been noted that there's something um, very clear uh, and direct about the way Fisher played, maybe a bit like his personality. Perhaps I shouldn't be going too far into that, but anyway, he exchanged and simply played b4. So Petrosian took. Why did Black do this? Why did Fisher do this? Well, first it leaves these pieces vulnerable. So there are tactics here. And second, he can actually start to attack the pawn on d4 with bishop c3. Once that bishop is exchanged off, then this pawn becomes on d4 becomes weaker. But also he hasn't forgotten about the a pawn. That can advance and then the bishop will follow up behind it. Um, I mean, well, I'll give you an example of the tactic. So, for example, after rook f3, which stops, well, seemingly stops bishop c3, and perhaps looks to go over here, but actually this is just a good move. And this leads to an excellent position for black. After rook c8, um, remember there's a back rank problem for white as well. Um, if rook b1, now that will solve, that will protect the bishops, but then just a5, and then the bishop will come to a6. Um, it looks extremely nasty, and you can see that black is completely secure with the, the, the a pawn and the bishop, you know, locked together. And white has no chance of an attack on the king's side, which basically means that these pawns in the middle are just kind of sitting targets, actually. So it's not a nice position for white to play. So Petrosian advance with, with a d pawn, probably a good idea, actually. Um, and if he plays accurately, 
he should be able to hold this position uh, with with bishop a2 just hanging on to this pawn um, white gets pushed around a bit here you know like this and like this but i can see a situation where if white is careful then black will probably take a pawn in the middle white should be able to take that pawn there and you know maybe white will lose another or lose the f pawn as well it should end up in a draw but instead Petrosian played bishop c2 i think he still had the vain idea that he could launch some kind of kingside attack with this pawn duo and the bishop on this diagonal but this plays into Fischer's hands completely um, because these these advanced pawns leave the diagonals open and well black is a pawn up here and it's a strong pawn actually let's let's see pawn coming to d4 locks the rook into this beautiful position opens up this diagonal g2 is now a serious weakness if rook fb1 then Korchnoi gives this variation queen c6 so now there's pressure on the diagonal and after this there's a very nice variation d3 so queen takes rook allows queen takes g2 and the threat is rook e2 and if rook here we do this attack the queen queen takes pawn and now queen takes g2 check and rook e1 mate what well, a mate next move uh, not forced but just gives you an idea of uh, the these typical tactics in the position when g2 g2 pawn is weak but also the back rank as well so d4 has just been played by black rook a b1 for white attacking the queen queen went to a6 so he's looking to sneak in with rook e2 the queen supports that um, if queen takes pawn then well Korsnoy likes this variation it is very attractive queen e2 threatening this obviously rook takes bishop allows queen takes rook mate and rook g1 defends that pawn and now simply bishop a8 with the cute idea of rook g3 adding more firepower against the g2 pawn and of course if that's taken then queen h5 mate uh, that was a misdirected error so coming back here queen a6 just played rook f2 defends along the second rank but now Fisher really consolidates the position. The d4 pawn is protected. The king steps off the diagonal with king g1, but bishop e4, that's a cold-blooded move. Fisher can see that g2 is now protected, so the bishop, well, he's had enough of that bishop on this diagonal. Exchanges off the light squared bishop means it's going to be easier to advance the d-pawn like so and I like what happens now Fisher <laughs> triples against the pawn on f4 so that forces the g-pawn to advance and now white is not only exposed on the first rank but the second rank as well once that pawn has advanced let's see how that works out in practice so basically by exchanging off this rook then the second rank becomes more exposed and yeah the king is in trouble or the pawn is going through and this was plain sailing rooks exchanged queen takes f4 and Fisher breaks through to the king. Rather reminds me a little bit of the Korchnoi Karpov, famous Korchnoi Karpov World Championship game where Karpov was playing against an isolated queen's pawn um, and at, at a certain moment switched over into a kingside attack 
well, maybe this one was on the cards for a long time, of course, as Petrosian had advanced the F pawn. But uh, yeah, here at the 40th move, Petrosian resigned. You can see that his king is getting cut to shreds, and there's a threat to check here with either queen or rook. Well, a really convincing game by Fisher. Um, he just outplayed Petrosian completely, strategically, actually. But once again, we had a very clever opening choice from Fisher. And we saw, well, a demoralized Petrosian, but also a player that uh, was really caught in two minds as to how he should be playing for a win in this game. Hope you're enjoying this series. Do uh, like, comment, share and subscribe. And uh, do check out the previous videos that we've recorded. And don't forget, if you want to support the channel, do check out our links to PayPal and Patreon.com. Thanks for watching.